Greetings, fellow aliens. Welcome to Galactic Maths. My name is Clorndon, and today we will be discussing the most well-known application of extremely inefficient algorithms, curtailing the galactic superbrain repair bots in the event of a rogue bot changing its prime directive to self-replicate forever. Inefficient algorithms were not always required to curtail these robotic replicators. In their early history, their standard mode of operation was to find matter, gather all the parts until it has what it needs, manually extract what it could use to build its clone, and then manually construct itself. This was obviously a slow process and barely caused an inconvenience. But one day, a rogue clonebot stumbled upon a dark matter synthesizer. These devices are used most commonly for food synthesizers aboard spacecraft, but when one of these clonebots realized it could use the synthesizer to scan itself holding a synthesizer, its speed was no longer limited by the time it took to physically construct. Entire planets worth of matter got converted into these robots after a clonebot obtained a matter synthesizer, because this exponential growth means runtime of creating n clones is O of log n, which is remarkably efficient. Bio-administrators caught on and petitioned the galactic bureaucracy to disable matter synthesizers creating more matter synthesizers, but the Sagittarian matter synthesizer lobby pushed back, as this method was obviously incredibly cheap for manufacturing purposes. Eventually, the galactic bureaucracy required a firmware update to all synthesizers to come with a fail-safe that if they ever create a copy of themselves, the new synthesizer can still work, but the old will be permanently disabled until the proper paperwork is signed off. This marked a huge victory for the galactic bureaucracy. This restricted their growth to linear growth. This doesn't come without problems. The speed of their quantum processors can still make this problematic, so efforts were made to hack into the robot. To understand that, let's do a deep dive into superbrain computing architecture. Clone bots are descended from superbrain repair bots, and as a result, they use superbrain computing architecture. Superbrain computing is powered by tiny cybernetic cells, with fundamental operations in them, like compare, increment, and store memory. These cells are connected with computing axons for program flow and data carrying purposes. A larger type of cell called a function cell takes in a group of these cells and their corresponding connections, as well as their connections to other cells. This makes for a convenient way to organize programs into layers of sub-programs. Here is a very simple functional cell. An input comes in, its value gets incremented four times as the output. We can call it the plus four cell, and label it like so. Many cells can be linked together to make a sophisticated program. Notice how the last cell even branches. Now let's zoom out and look at a program that powers an entire robot. This is a simplified brain of what a standard superbrain repair bot looked like. Cloning was occasionally necessary subprogram as repair bots were often captured and chopped down for parts. Several solar cycles ago, a nanorot started chewing on some of the computing axons in a repair bot as it was cloning itself. This led to the repair bot continually cloning itself, and all other parts of the brain went unused, and this is how the first clone bot was born. Galactic hackers wanted to slow these bots since the bureaucracy wouldn't do anything more, so they engineered programmable nanorats. It became standard practice for dark matter synthesizer manufacturers to have a programmable nanorot with a custom subprogram to attach on to any clone bot it detects. Originally, they came up with the easiest program, waiting forever. But the superbrain sent out induction inspectors as an upgrade to all bots with their architecture. Essentially, if you can't inductively prove that your change will not prevent the robot from completing its prime directive, it will reject the change. Unfortunately, the prime directive is now to create infinite clones. So with that in mind, let's explore some programs that this induction inspector will allow. One of the most basic sub-programs is a for loop. It takes in an input that gets stored in memory, then the comparator passes this signal to the incrementer until it surpasses the target. The operators shown in white are instantaneous with quantum entanglement. The end result here is when you put a signal in the side, you get a delay of that many ticks from the incrementer. A very common use is to put a functional cell in the part notated with two arrows, and it will be executed a specified number of times. If we pass the generation number into this loop, let's look at how many ticks through the incrementer each generation will have to wait. This grows at a function proportional to n squared in the long run, so we notate this by big O of n squared. Now remember how you could execute a program multiple times? Well one of these programs can be a for loop itself. If we analyze how many ticks the incrementer goes through with this setup, we get a function that can be bounded by a multiple of n cubed. As good as nested for loops were, quantum processors were still very efficient and could execute polynomial efficient algorithms for large inputs. Galactic hackers came up with a new framework for their algorithms. The B circle passively sits on a line and broadcasts a signal to the next generation, and the W circle takes in an input and waits for a broadcast before it outputs it. The subprogram on the far right allows us to handle a base case more easily for the induction robot. The base case module sends a signal to the bottom if it is the first bot to find a synthesizer, and to the top for all of the base bot's descendants. If we put two wait signals, then each bot has to wait for its parent to complete twice. If we find out how many times the base bot has to execute before the nth generation creates a child, we find that this function runs in big O of 2 to the n efficiency. This is far slower than all polynomial efficiencies, and with fewer parts to keep track of. But the clone bots fought back. Remember our old friend the induction inspector? This little guy just got the ultimate upgrade. This is a multiversal bounded loop synthesizer, supplied to the base robot. If the total number of times the base robot has to execute clone to get to the nth generation can be calculated with a set number of four loops and memory. Then it would call into parallel universes to execute these instantaneously. For loops and memory cells can be used to do multiplication by a constant, and further nested for loops can calculate very very high values. This decimated everything the galactic hackers had. 
even crazy inefficient algorithms like n factorial and n to the n could be calculated with a single input into a previously set number of bounded loops. Not all hope was lost. Although the induction checker still requires us to eventually create infinite generations, this multiversal synthesizer will not draw from parallel universes if it is incapable of creating a program that gives the number of passes required in a base robot. The hackers created one final set of components, the value incrementer and reader. The value incrementer passively rests on a line and has a memory initialized at zero, even after being cloned. Every time a signal passes through it, its internal counter increments by one. The reader is associated with a value incrementer, but can read from all of its ancestors if it is a clone. It has a memory cell with the value from a specified generation, depending on its flavor. For example, a gray reader reads the current generation, a yellow reads from the previous generation, and a red reads from the very first generation. This is the final copy of what galactic hackers have managed to sneak by. As soon as it enters, it immediately reads the value incrementer of the original robot, then waits until the previous generation's value incrementer has surpassed it. For my earthling programmers, do you think there's a way to replicate this efficiency with only bounded for loops? Pause here if you'd like to think on it. Let's check this out from our inductor inspector's point of view. Since the value incrementer of the zeroth generation always increases, and under the assumption that the previous generation's value incrementer always increases, the yellow reader will always eventually allow a signal to pass through the comparator. Therefore, all generations of robots' value incrementers increase to infinity, so he allows this configuration. But how about its performance? Let's run the first few and see what happens. The first bot increments his debug counter and runs clone. For the second generation, we will show the memory cell that stores generation zero's value. The starting bot increments, and now, its value is higher than what bot 2 has stored, so it increments, and updates its memory cell. Now that it's incremented from 0 to 1, it can make a clone. The value of our third bot starts at 0, and its memory is updated. Starting bot updates, and bot 2 can proceed. Bot 2 updates. Bot 3 has to wait since the value incrementer of bot 2 has not surpassed what's in its memory yet. Bot 1 updates. Bot 2 can update again, and finally, bot 3 updates, and since it went from 0 to 1, it can make its clone. Our starting bot has only gone through 4 iterations, and we're already at 4 bots. Is this algorithm going to slow these clones down at all? Before we proceed, take note, bot 2 is always one behind bot 1, and bot 3 must wait for every other increment from bot 1 and 2 in order to proceed. Now, let's fast forward a bit. Our fifth robot appears after 12 iterations from the base bot. This is because we had to wait for bot 3 to reach 5, and it could only go every other increment of our base bot. This is looking more promising. And on top of that, our fourth bot has only reached 1. We need to wait for it to reach 13 before we get our sixth bot. How many iterations will that take for our starting bot? It turns out this takes a whole 65,532 iterations. What just happened? The secret sauce of this is that most other programs the hackers used could have its efficiency defined with just one function. Notice that each bot has their own function for reaching their counter value for n, each getting harder and harder to calculate than the last. You may notice the fifth and sixth robot have an up arrow. This is Knut's up arrow notation. One arrow is the same as exponentiation, and any more is a repeated iteration of one less arrows, as shown here. As we go further and further to the right, the next bot adds one more arrow. Each function itself is something the multiverse synthesizer could handle, but no matter how many loops you put in there, one generation beyond it will require another predetermined loop. Therefore, a multiverse synthesizer could not handle an arbitrary number of bots. The galactic hackers have won, defeating the clone bots' multiversal synthesizers. We can actually express all values of i displayed here for any arbitrary robot with one expression. In the white is the definition of Conway's arrow notation, which is an even more general version of Knut's up arrow notation. Earthling mathematicians have invented a function called the Ackerman function, which is remarkably quick and simple to write using recursion. The fact that it's not primitive recursive means we cannot unwind it into a single set of instructions with bounded loops. If we look at its table of values, it is only off by one from what our robots produce. Although it is way quicker to write in these three equations or lines of code, hopefully this clone bot program can give a better understanding or intuitive sense of just how these numbers grow so astronomically. In the next episode, we will cover modifications for this rule that allow us to change the base, and we will discuss an application for how these arrows create one of Earthling's most famously gigantic numbers, Graham's number. I'd like to give a huge shout out to Zog from Beetlejuice for originally inspiring me to share alien information with Earthlings, and 3 Blue 1 Brown for running a contest to finally give me a reason to do it. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to be alien.